Welcome to the second season of DIY World Improvement, the showcase for individuals who are rolling up their sleeves, unpacking their skills toolboxes, and applying passion and elbow grease to projects that help fix the world. I'm your host, Catherine Carlozzi. Today I'm showcasing Susan McLaurie and Albie Hecht, who founded the award-winning nonprofit film production company called Shine Global in 2005. The name is derived from the mission, to shine a light on the abuse and exploitation of children worldwide through films that raise awareness of their plight, promote action, and inspire political change. Susan serves as the company's executive director. In her day job, she's a social worker and a health education professor at Keene University in Union, New Jersey. Albie chairs the board, and his day job is CEO of Worldwide Biggies, a digital entertainment studio he founded also in 2005, which was obviously a very busy year in the home of this New Jersey couple. As former president of Nickelodeon Entertainment and Spike TV, Albie was responsible for launching hits that entertained an entire generation of kids, like SpongeBob SquarePants, Rugrats, Blue's Clues, Jimmy Neutron, Dora the Explorer, and Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. I sat down with these film anthropists at their home in Montclair late this summer. It was shortly after their current film, The Harvest, opened in New York and L.A. They, along with actress and activist Eva Longoria Parker, are the film's executive producers. Before you decided to create Shine Global and make your documentaries, you were actively supporting AMREF, the African Medical and Research Foundation, for years. And one of the things that fascinates me is what prompts people to take that step from supporting something, getting involved with it, writing checks to it, and going that next step into what I call DIY world improvement, which is creating something new to address a problem or an issue or an unrealized potential that you see in society. What caused you to go that extra step? I personally always had an, a strong interest in Africa, and it was really through that initial interest that I learned about AMREF and the work that they do. They are a very important public health provider throughout Africa. So I decided to give money to them, and then over time developed a relationship with Lisa Meadowcroft, the executive director of AMREF here in the United States, as did Albi. It was really through Lisa that we learned about the children in northern Uganda, and it was because of that that we decided to do war dance. She happened to tell us about the night commuting children who were literally walking for their lives every single night of the year, leaving their homes in the bush to go into one of two small towns where there was a military presence because at that time Uganda had been the scene of a 20-year civil war. Even worse than that, the uh, that part of the country was being terrorized by the Lord's Resistance Army, which was abducting children at night and forcing them to become mm-hmm soldiers are killing them. Albie had just left Viacom, and I was, as I have been all my career, teaching, and I'm I'm a teacher and I'm a social worker. I've not had any involvement in films, but when I came home and I told Albie about it... There was an opportunity for me, for the first time, to pick myself up from the corporate world and ask about why you get involved, is is to think about your new vision quest and what else you're going to do with your life. When we heard the story, I mean, I think Sue thought, let's have a fundraiser here in Montclair for the town of Gulu, where the epicenter of this horror, and I was struck by this image of these children emotionally, visually, and said, well, I don't really know how to do a fundraiser, but I know how to make movies, so let's make a movie. Why would we make a movie? Because A, we have the skill, and B, that really spoke to us as a different way of doing philanthropy. We have tithed our whole life, and but this was another way to say, how can we make an impact? And that became sort of the mantra for Shine, to say, well, we're going to be a nonprofit, mm-hmm. but we're also going to make films because they have a very special impact on people, and speak to them in a different way than just giving. So we can have a more widespread global potential impact on people emotionally with issues by making films. I watched War Dance again recently. I probably hadn't seen it since right after it came out, and that was, what, 2000? End of 2007. The impact was as strong and maybe even stronger. Talk a little bit about the film and making the film. In the summer of 2005, Albie and myself and our children and uh, Carrie Kim, uh, Albie's uh, producer, we went to Uganda and to Kenya, and we went with AMREF on a junket to see a lot of their public health programs in both of those countries. And we had to talk our way into the war zone. It was actually kind of a funny conversation because I said to Lisa, who was planning this, I said, we're going to really want to go to Gulu. And she said, you can't go into the war zone. I said, the whole reason for doing this, I mean, I teach health. I'm interested in, in the, mm-hmm. the public health programs, but the real impetus was to go to the war zone to scout for locations. We knew 
we wanted to make this film. Tug of war back and forth, and finally she says to me in exasperation, Susan, Amref frowns on taking donors into war zones. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> she wasn't wrong in the sense that when, once we got there, I mean, there were moments when we were looking at, at camps because at this point, unfortunately, the story had changed. And this is the, the thrill and the horror of making documentaries <laughs> is you get there and you think it's one story uh-huh. and, and the not. stories keep evolving. So yeah. the children who had been commuting up to like five miles to go to the town to be protected from the soldiers who were abducting them in their own villages. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a result of that process, the government had moved them all into camps. So the whole population was in camps now, and so we were like, oh, okay, well, that story, that that, that beautiful, horrible image of the children night commuting doesn't really exist. On our way to the camps, we we were with soldiers, and it was hard to tell the soldiers from the rebels in the sense that they were wearing sort of Mickey Mouse t-shirts and rubber boots. Rubber boots, (laughs) it wasn't that official, and they looked young. No uniforms. No uniforms. So at one point we stopped, and the press attache for AMRAF wanted to go to the bathroom, so they had stopped. Deserted, deserted road, road with very water. seven foot tall stalks of, of grass of yeah. some sort. And the other, the colonel from the other vehicle came running out and said, what do you do? What do you do? We can't stop. And we were getting translated from the driver and get back in, Mickey. And the guy was really upset. The driver said, well, he's right. We shouldn't be stopping because the rebels were probably out there. And we also stared at the grass. Uh-huh. And it was that point when we said, bringing our children here was a, was <laughs> they a were, bad they were idea. Young, young children, but still, we yeah. do like them. It was a bad idea. So there was <laughs> yeah. a sense of danger. So we didn't know what we were going to shoot and one day we were visiting a school with our group and the principal alluded to National Music and Dance Festival and he said, you know, for the first time in many years, three schools in the war zone will be represented. We remember the moment. We just looked at each other and we said, that's the story. So the director, Sean Sean Fine, Fine. came uh, to Uganda about a week or two later. He really spent time in two of the three camps. He shot footage in both. We Uh, weren't sure of who we were going to follow. From a production standpoint, it was accelerated. We thought we were going to scout, we were going to find locations for him, places he was going to come do some initial interviews for a week or two, and then go home. But the dance competition was three weeks later. I didn't realize it was that tight. Right, so we, we had to, at that point, accelerate everything, and he had to come and stay. He, as Sue said, stayed with two camps, uh, because we kept looking at footage saying, which of the people we're going to follow, not only this one, this one, or what are the children within those camps. So mm-hmm. it was a very accelerated process. And you ended up with Nancy and Rose and, and Dominic, Dominic yeah. who are unforgettable. The stories of what they went through after seeing the film the second time. I called Sue and asked her, what happened to them? Where are they now? What are they doing? Because it's hard to watch a boy talk about being forced by the rebels to kill innocent people with a hoe. And look at this beautiful child who's so focused on his xylophone in this yeah. competition. And each of the three kids you followed had such horrific stories yeah. that it's just amazing. It's, they are a triumph of the human spirit. Any one of them could have easily been broken by their experiences but they weren't and I think they're also a testament to the transformative power of music and art because as you saw in the film they derive so much of their strength and their purpose from performing together. And from the pride also in representing their tribe yeah. the Acholi and trying to win for them. It was very politically charged too and we didn't realize it at first but the dance that they won with which is the traditional Acholi dance the, the civil war is between the Acholi tribe and the central government and the president the of Uganda civil war. yeah uh, yeah Museveni is from another tribe and you don't appreciate this until you get to Uganda but tribal membership is extremely important and for them to come to Kampala the capital mm-hmm. and dance their dance we really didn't know how it would be received that it was a triumph they brought that audience to its feet. And I think this is true in many ways of the Uganda people generally. They were genuinely happy that teams from the north were there and that there was some effort towards reunification. In 2008, you went back to the camps with the film, which nobody there had seen yet. And you went back with director Sean Fine and his wife Andrea and the crew. What was the impact of that screening, which you made into the 14-minute movie? War Dance. Um, War Dance. Dance. When we filmed in Patong, the, the camp 
itself. There were about 50,000 people squeezed together. Two years later, the government had set up several satellite camps closer to the, the people's original homes in an mm-hmm. effort to encourage them to go, to go back. back. But some of them were still too scared to go. So there were about 9,000 people there that night. After the opening ceremonies, we all walk over to this field, and we started to broadcast the movie, and we were told afterwards by the reps from Film Aid and Open Air who walked the perimeters, came back and they said, there are people standing shoulder to shoulder in a space the size of two football fields watching this. So it was really amazing. It was amazing to see the kids again. We were nervous because we didn't know how they'd respond because Sean, the night before, had shown them their families and their teachers the film for the very first time. And there were those scenes of the children recounting what had happened to them, and particularly Dominic's because at the time that we shot the film, he hadn't told his mother about what he'd been forced forced to do. do. And so Sean said to the kids, you watch this and you tell us if you're comfortable with us screening this. And if you're not, we won't. And they said, no, it's okay. I just can't even imagine what that was like. Really, for many of them, it was the first movie they'd ever seen because Film Aid had never been there before. And here's the the sort of unnerving thing about it. The film ends and then it's complete silence. (laughs) But it's like, you know, you have to be taught to clap. I don't know if theaters in Kampala, if people clap or if it's a cultural thing, but it was absolutely (laughs) silent. That that prepared us for the rest of our film. (laughs) Well, and speaking of the rest of your film, I had the pleasure of seeing The Harvest or uh, La Coseca uh, when you aired it here in Montclair. And and I know it's opened in New York, it's opened in L.A. And this time we're looking at child agricultural workers, the kids who feed America. As in War Dance, it tells the story of three children. Talk about how this one came to be. After War Dance, uh, we got a lot of filmmakers coming to us. Uh, You know, they were attracted by the idea of Shine Global, which is uh, our nonprofit that dedicated to ending the exploitation of children through the making of films and other media. And, you know, our model was all the money we raised went to the making of the films and whatever money we make goes back to the children we document through the NGOs and other organizations that we affiliate with. And I think a lot of filmmakers were attracted to that. And they started submitting ideas to us. And we ran actually ran a small contest for new ideas at Sundance. One of the ideas that emerged was from Robin Romano, who was a filmmaker and and award-winning photographer and a lifelong advocate for child labor issues. And Rory O'Connor, who was also a noted documentary maker. And it was about the situation in America where every year approximately 400,000 American children migrate and pick almost 25% of the food we eat. And it was a stunning statistic. It was a stunning idea that this was happening here in America and that in a sense it felt like America was a third world country in agriculture. And I think, again, that hit the chord of shine and what we do, which is to shine a light on an issue that you may not know exists and it transports you to a place, you know, cinematically that you Mm -hmm. haven't seen, which in this case were the children in the fields of America. And so we engaged in making the film at that point. Do you have any idea how many kids in New Jersey are working in the fields? New Jersey seems to be less affected than many other states. When we did the screening and we had the gentleman from CACA come up, which is Mm -hmm. a farm worker rights organization down near Camden, they said, well, we have young men. We don't have very many children here. And I don't honestly know in New Jersey, but it would be a mistake to think that somehow the Northeast escapes it because we're Mm -hmm. clearly on one of the migratory routes. And a few weeks ago, I spoke to a labor lawyer south of Rochester, and I said, how big a problem is it in New York State with child labor? He said, it's a big problem, and it's getting bigger. And in fact, we're seeing more and more unaccompanied minors, which was of additional concern. TV, Albie was responsible for launching hits that entertained an entire generation of kids like SpongeBob SquarePants, Rugrats, Blues Clues, Jimmy Neutron, Dora the Explorer, and Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. I sat down with these film anthropists applying passion and elbow grease to projects that help fix the world. I'm your host, Catherine Carlozzi. Today I'm showcasing Susan McLaurie and Albie Hecht, who founded the award-winning nonprofit film production company called Shine Global in 2005. The name is derived from the mission, to shine a light on the abuse and exploitation of children worldwide through films that raise awareness of their plight, promote action, 
and inspire political change. Susan serves as the company's executive director. In her day job, she's a social worker and a health education professor at Keene University in Union, New Jersey. Albie chairs the board, and his day job is CEO of Worldwide Biggies, a digital entertainment studio he founded also in 2005, which was obviously a very busy year in the home of this New Jersey couple. As former president of Nickelodeon Entertainment and Spike T. Welcome to the second season of DIY World Improvement, the showcase for individuals who are rolling up their sleeves, unpacking their skills toolboxes, 